So we find ourselves in that time of living in the light of the resurrection. Easter has come and gone, but Easter season remains with us. We have this celebration of a risen Christ and the glories that go with that celebration. And now the question is, in light of the resurrection, how is it that we live? How is it that we continue this journey with God? How is it that we move through time in light of the resurrection? What difference does that make? My fear is that we tend to think of the resurrection as an event. We sing Christ the Lord is risen today, and we go on with our lives as if that didn't change things. And the bottom line is that changes everything. It changes everything from the way in which we view the state of sin in which we find ourselves and death to which we're captive until he comes again. It changes the way we mourn those who've passed before us. Just this week, members of this church lost two very precious people. Paul Muff passed away last Sunday. Many of you know Diane and their family. and They've been attending for some time. And Joe Trumbull lost her sister this week, a little too young. And we continue to live life with loss. And yet the way we, we approach that and the way we handle that, the way we see that and the way we experience that changes because of the resurrection. It's one thing to talk about resurrection and it's another thing to know that Christ is not just resurrected, but seated in glory and power, and someone who understands us and speaks on our behalf and is in so many ways our brother and like us. So the question comes to us in, in light of all that, what fundamental change gets made? And I want to start, I think, with the first clue. And that is, I'm going to start in the New Testament reading, 1 Corinthians 5, 6b. We don't make our own bread anymore, but if you make bread, you know that you start with a little water and a little yeast and a little flour and a little oil, and that becomes dough, which you give time to rise, preferably in a warm environment, and ultimately, then you bake it. I mean, good breads are remarkably simple. Four or five ingredients, six ingredients tops. It's all in the yeast and the quality of the ingredients, the amount of time you leave it to rise, the baking that you give it, the kind of, might have a little egg coating or something to give it some gloss. Whatever it is, we all know good bread when we taste it, yes? I'm looking forward to eating good bread today. But... We don't, since we don't usually make our own bread and live with the process of yeast, we're a little bit isolated from two things that happened scripturally. One was the Passover meal. We bake bread with preservatives. So we go to the grocery store, we buy a loaf, we freeze half of it if we have a small family. If we have a big family, we might go through several loaves a week so we don't need to freeze it or refrigerate it. It just sits out in a bread bin and boom, it's gone. Sandwiches, toast in the morning, you name it, it's... And there's, we usually get rid of it before it molds. We're usually pretty good about getting through our bread. That's our lives today. But in ancient times, there was no Save Mart. I don't need to remind you of that. No Vons, no whatever. Bread wasn't baked in bakeries. Bread was made in the household. And every day, the woman of the house would take a pinch of flour, a pinch of olive oil, a little salt, some water, and knead out bread and would bake that or roast that on a pan for the day, and that became the bread. At Passover time, the Lord instructed Moses to have the people make bread without yeast. There was no time to let that bread rise properly. There was no time to give it its full bake. It was to be made without yeast and cooked on the spot. And so that Passover feast accompanied not just with bread, but with the Paschal lamb, okay, becomes what Paul is referencing here in terms of his first, his instruction on how we might live. He draws us into the contemporary age where he says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, past tense. 
Now the Passover lamb or Paschal lamb isn't just the lamb that took and was cooked at Passover time and in every celebration marking it since, but the Paschal lamb is Christ who's died once now for all. And not only has the Paschal lamb been sacrificed, but he tells us to keep the festival with the, not with the old bread, not in the old way, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The new comes from the old because the old is tainted, as he puts it, with malice and wickedness. Now, I know that the people leaving Egypt were probably not very educated. They were a, a slave class of people. I know the people leaving Egypt uh, had trouble, as I might, wandering through that wilderness, trusting Moses' leadership, Aaron's leadership, and God's leadership. I know that when they made that journey, they had been through tremendous difficulties and suffering. So I don't know precisely how Paul is making the analogy to malice and wickedness. Maybe it was the hatred they had for the Egyptians. Maybe it was the wickedness of idolatry they carried forth from them, for they were no longer a people solely focused on God. They had been influenced by the culture around them. I don't know if he's just talking about this allegorically as he's making Christ the Paschal Lamb and saying, look, in light of the resurrection, this is how you live. You live differently. We move from the house of hatred. We move from the house of wrongdoing to the house of love and righteousness. That is a fundamental shift. I want to just talk about that a second in light of conversion. I guess what Paul is really saying is that in light of the resurrection, we are to live as if we've experienced a conversion. We make a lot of Paul's conversion, don't we? And yet, what was he converted from to? He was converted from a zealous love of God that drove him to do awful things, including persecuting Christians, to a recognition of Christ as the risen Lord and becoming one of the strongest advocates and proliferators of the Christian message. We see him changing from, not from atheism to theism, not from disbelief to belief, but we see him shifting in his understanding of who God is, and it's a major shift. God isn't just an Old Testament God who demands retribution for anything that might smack of something false, as this new, the way is, these followers of the way, these followers of Jesus. No, when Paul sees the resurrected Christ, this is what he refers to on the Damascus Road, as one abnormally born, as an apostle abnormally born. He wasn't with the apostles who saw Christ. He wasn't there when the news of the resurrection came. He wasn't with those in the upper room who, to whom Christ appeared. He wasn't with the 500 or so witnesses. He came after all that. Christ appeared to him on the road as one abnormally born and his witness changed. He moved from belief and theism and faith in one kind of God and moved over to a God who saves and redeems and is present among us. He shifted his thinking. That was Paul's conversion. For those of us who've grown up in the church, our conversion is maybe less dramatic than Paul's. Maybe it's very similar. Chances are our conversion is more like what the disciples went through. The disciples, you know, had to go through a gradual shift in their understanding of who Jesus was. First a rabbi, teacher, and a good one, but ultimately, son of man, son of God. That's Mark's gospel. I think I did a series on that about seven years ago, and one of these days I'll do that series again because I know I've forgotten it. I'm guessing you have too. What Paul in this text is telling us is that now in light of the resurrection, in light of the sacrifice not of a lamb or the eating of unleavened bread because we're embarking on a journey, he's telling us that in light of the fact that Christ has been crucified and now is resurrected, we need to continue to celebrate this feast, but differently. It's from the standpoint of having been changed having been 
converted. Throwing out the old yeast, throwing out the old bread, and having a new understanding, a new yeast, a new perspective, a new bread. Our text in Isaiah 25 Sorry about the typo, that was my mistake. It's Isaiah 25, 6 to 9, not 15, 6 to 9, as your bulletin says. We have another clue about how we live post resurrection. For those of you who were here last night, you know that I talked for a little while about one of my passions, and that's food and spirituality. And what we see when Jesus is present is. Very interesting because he lives a life of celebration. Jesus keeps all of the feasts. Rarely do we find record, if ever, of him fasting. He does in the desert as he's preparing for his ministry. He does as he, as he seeks quiet time. There, there's fasting component to that. There's a strengthening in all of that for him spiritually. But Jesus is a big celebrant. He spends time with friends in their homes. He he, he he dines with them, he joins in their, their celebrations, and he keeps all the feasts. And we find the Pharisees accusing Jesus at some point of being a glutton and a drunkard. Very interesting passage. Jesus is accused of being a drunken and a glut, uh, excuse me, a glutton and a drunkard because of the way in which he lives while he's here. He says, I'm only going to be with you a little while. Feast with me. I'm only going to be with you. And then we find post, as he's preparing for the crucifixion and making the promises that he makes in John, he says at the Last Supper, I'm not going to feast like this again until I do so with you. It doesn't mean he's fasting. It means he's looking forward to that way of being with us. So when we think about life post-resurrection, it's not a fast, it's a feast. And it's a spiritual feast as well as a literal one. And like all good feasts, there are excellent things to drink and excellent things to eat. Isaiah prophetically says, On this mountain of the, Lo the Lord of hosts will make a for all peoples a feast of rich food. Now the mountain, first of all, is the high place, and it's where God ends up meeting the people, right? Particularly Moses. Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the law, to receive the covenant. He goes up on the mountain to meet with God. It's on the mountain that he sees the back of God pass before him in that nuclear kind of moment. I mean, you know, just picture Moses tucked in the cleft of a rock and God covering his face and passing by with his backside to Moses and Moses being so uh, radiant that people couldn't bear to look at him. I just think of it as like a nuclear explosion that, that just kind of happened on that mountain. He's radioactive as he comes down from the mountain from this presence of God and he's just glowing, you know. Only he doesn't get cancer and die. It's, it's, it's just a, it's not a nuclear thing. It's, it's a God thing. So here he is on the mountain, this high place where the Lord is met and where Elijah meets the, the prophets of Baal and God acts in a mighty way on Carmel and where so many things have happened. Jerusalem, the mountain, where Abraham has gone up and uh, almost sacrificed Isaac and so forth. On this mountain of the Lord hosts will, will make a feast, excuse me, on this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food filled with marrow. Now, for those of you who are vegetarian, let me explain. Soups made with meat stock are watery, they're thin, but soups made with bone stock that's been properly cooked, are cloudy and rich and full of proteins. And these soups are not just healing, but they have a taste component that's different than a soup that just is steeped in vegetable or meat for a time. And so the richness is increased because of the marrow. Richness in terms of nutrient, richness in terms of healing power, and richness in terms of the taste. So it's not just a, food, a, a feast with rich food, but it's rich food prepared in the most healing and, and rich kind of way, of well-aged wines strained clear. So there's an aesthetic component too. It's a beautiful feast. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, 
the sheet that is spread over all nations. And what is that shroud? What is that sheet? He will swallow up death forever. That's what the resurrection life looks like. Death is swallowed up forever. Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears and the disgrace of his people will be taken away from the earth. For the Lord has spoken. This will be his declaration. This will be his creative act as he moves beyond resurrection. And verse 9, it will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and so we wait, so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we've waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Okay. I can bring this to a focus more quickly. So, living life post-resurrection means we live in a way that speaks to the conversion that's taken place within us. We've moved from a house of malice and a house of deceit and wickedness to a house of love and righteousness. That's our movement. Through the grace of God, we have shifted our thinking and priority. And post-resurrection, we move from a state of I don't know, celebrating some feasts and celebrating some fasts historically. We aren't so big on that. To moving to a season of feasting and not just feasting on ordinary food, but on the richest and most nutritious and most joyful to eat kinds of foods. We move to an aesthetic feast, a spiritual feast, a literal feast. And this is the feast that we live from his from now until his coming and beyond. We live in light of the resurrection and we celebrate. It says, let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. A couple, I don't know, months ago and now it feels like, maybe it was just weeks, I was talking about the problem with sin language in contemporary culture how without it we don't really have a means of then confessing, and if there's no sin and no confession, what's the point of forgiveness? And if there's no sin and no confession and no forgiveness, what's the point of a Savior? What are we to be saved from? And if there's no need of a Savior, who was Jesus anyway, and why does it matter? And if there's no Jesus, why are we calling ourselves Christians, and why would we be gathered here today? So you can see quickly how this, this connects. And with that, I lost my train of thought. Happens rarely, but it does happen. What we have as we look at this story of Jesus and the grace and the salvation that he brings is a movement into something new, an anticipation and a reality. We have something that moves us to a state of celebration, remembering what he's done, being glad and rejoicing in his salvation, being able to recognize that we have come from a place of sin through confession into grace and forgiveness and hope and newness and life and ultimately life anew forever with him. Feasting on the richest of foods, and well-aged wines, to use the biblical metaphor. I'm sure there will be a juice option for Adventists there, just as we'll have a crown with a watch in it instead of jewels. I'm being silly. Luke 24 is a long text, and thank you, Pat, for reading that. That was a big one. But it is the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, and we get a few clues in this story about how we're to live post-resurrection. You see, Jesus had, re had, had been raised from the dead. They'd gone to the tomb. They didn't find him. They didn't know what it all meant. And they're walking with Jesus post-resurrection, and they don't see him. They don't know him. Now, this is not surprising because categorically in my mind, if I know somebody's gone, I might find a likeness or a, a similarity or I might think of somebody as reminding me of somebody, but I'm not going to be thinking it's them. And they know Jesus has, in theory, 
arisen, but they don't understand what they're, what they're, what's right before them. So they're journeying, and it is something stirring within them. There's a memory being pulled forward. Their hearts are touched by what is being said, and they're actually saying the funniest things to Jesus. Have you not heard the story of Jesus? They're saying to Jesus how he, how he was crucified. Have you not heard the story of what happened? And Jesus is just going along with it. He's just going along with it. What that tells me is that sometimes we need to let people come to see Jesus for themselves and recognize him for themselves and to journey with them and to not force them into vision that they're not ready for. I know you have people in your life you've been praying for, maybe for years. Lord, I'm praying that this person will come to know Jesus. Lord, I'm praying that this person might have the peace that I've found in you. Lord, I'm praying that you will change the heart and the life of this person. And Jesus on the road to Emmaus doesn't say, hey, you guys, it's me. Don't you recognize me? What's wrong with you? He, he just walks with them. And he lets them tell the story. And I get from that that we need to journey with people who don't yet know him Knowing him, Jesus knew who he was, and listening to their stories and breaking bread with them. Because it comes to this, as Jesus breaks the bread and blesses it, the aha moment comes. It's a moment centered around food and spirituality. It's a recollection of the upper room. It's a reference back to the salvation that came as Israel left Egypt through that Paschal meal. It's a recognition of something incredibly deep and sacred. As Jesus breaks the bread and as he blesses it, <laughs> they see him. They see him. In this moment, they know who he is. And he sups with them. He dines with them. Life in the post-resurrection is a community of sharing, of breaking bread together, of journeying together, of hearing one another's stories, of waiting, and of joy and feasting and gratitude and recognition of the salvation that's come. It's a way of living differently. Don't know what that's going to look like for you. I'm working on what that looks for me. I appreciate the pieces that this community puts together as we think about journeying together as a, as a body, as we think about what it means spiritually to move forward in light of the resurrection. The road to Emmaus has another component to it too. He explains the scriptures to them. He tells them what they mean and explains to them scriptures about himself. Post-resurrection life may mean that too. It may mean that we take the time to be sure of who he is through the text we've been given. It may mean that we take the time to explain the scriptures to somebody who's seeking and looking for their way. I'm not giving you anything new. I'm not giving you a revolution in a can. We could talk about other religions. We could talk about contemporary philosophies or psychologies. We could talk about the gospel of prosperity or how to feel good through this or that. But the bottom line is the gospel is fairly simple and derived at from incredibly complicated sources. The simplicity is that in the resurrection, we live the life that Christ gives us to live and that he lived himself. It is a life of self-sacrifice. It is a life of taking up our cross. It is a life of following him. It is a life of laying our burdens at his feet and living light and free. I know it sounds contradictory, 
But the text says his burden is easy, his yoke is light. Or the other way around, his burden is light, his yoke is easy. I'm good at inverting things sometimes. You get the idea, yes? We live in a paradox. On the one hand, we carry our cross and follow him. There's this way of suffering that we too much must engage. And on the other hand, we cast our burdens at his feet. He carries them for us. We live free. We've been emancipated. We live in the freedom of the resurrection. We live in the freedom of Christ who died and rose again for our sins. We live in the glory of the resurrection. We live differently because we no longer hold on to wickedness and malice, greed and hatred and all the things that have brought about our destruction, all the things that brought about Christ's destruction. We live out of love and out of hope and out of peace and joy. It's not a revolution. We see. We journey with people who don't yet see. And we celebrate. We celebrate in community. We celebrate in family. Every day our gratitude focuses on the power of the risen Christ and the Christ who's yet to come to claim us. We grieve differently. We see death differently. And we experience the hope that comes in his resurrection because one day he says, not only have I resurrected, not only have I ascended, but I'll come again. And then you will be mine. And my resurrection will be your resurrection. And my life will be your life. And the tree of life that was planted in the garden where you once found your habitation is now the tree of life in the new Jerusalem where the river of life flows from the throne of God and passes between its two trunks, and where the leaves are given for the healing of the nation, and where the fruits are fresh and a new crop is harvested every month. And you and I, God says, will drink of the cup and eat of the bread and celebrate life forevermore. Amen. Freely we have been given, freely let us give, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. It is time now to collect our tithes and our offerings. May the deacons step forward.